Hi, right, everyone. Welcome to the show. The Supreme Court says no to the Biden administration's vaccine mandate for large businesses. I don't like saying I told you so, but remember all those people saying this was a slam dunk legally? I wasn't one of them. But first, the White House appears to have a major Fauci problem. According to a News Nation poll released today, only about 31% of voters surveyed said they trust the White House's top medical advisor as a source for information on COVID-19. Appears as though the good doctor has lost the trust of the American people. Now, look, I think Dr. Fauci made some mistakes, particularly in the early days, and can be criticized for that. I also think he's doing what he believes is best to save American lives. And I don't get the level of anger some have against him. But you know what? My view on this doesn't really matter. He works for the American people. And you, they, apparently want someone new in the role. Turns out Americans do trust their own doctors. More than 63% of people polled said they trust their own physicians for that sort of COVID information. I presume most of the doctors are getting their information from Dr. Fauci and the CDC, but that's not the point. It's a credibility, credibility issue with one man who fairly or unfairly appears to have lost the public trust. So can the White House continue to have a man who most Americans don't seem to trust on COVID spearheading the messaging on the administration's response to the pandemic and the Omicron surge? Joining me now, Philip Wegman, White House reporter for Real Clear Politics, and Ryan Grimm, DC bureau chief for The Intercept. Gentlemen, thank you for coming on the show, appreciate it. All right, so Philip, you, you gotta know that the Biden administration knows this, whether it's this poll or other polls, about Dr. Fauci. Is it possible that President Biden would consider replacing Anthony Fauci? I doubt that we see any replacement anytime soon because President Biden and Dr. Fauci are joined at the hip. Uh, if you go back to the campaign, the central premise was that he was going to be the adult in the room who was going to be able to listen to the experts and shut down the virus. So from the very beginning, that promise has been to listen to the medical experts, to listen to Dr. Fauci. And anytime you ask this White House a question about masks or vaccines, or the pandemic, they defer to Fauci and others. So I, I doubt that we will see uh, any replacement anytime soon, but perhaps as there's more polling, uh, maybe he, he uh, receives a little bit more from the uh, limelight. Yeah, but I guess I, I, I guess I would wonder when they view it as a political issue, right? All campaigns, particularly leading into 2022, are gonna care enormously about the politics of it. And Dr. Fauci is a huge issue politically. And so, look, as I've said, I think I don't have a problem with Dr. Fauci. I think that I trust most of what he says. I have concerns about some of the stuff early on. But again, from a political perspective, what I think doesn't matter. And I would think that at some point, Joe Biden might view it the same way and say, you know what? I like the guy. As you said, we're joined at the hip. But politically, this is killing me. Yeah, and I think that for better or worse, um, he has become the poster boy of pandemic politics. I think that the way that you explain these low poll numbers is frankly that a lot of people are, are tired of being told about the pandemic. They're tired of hearing about the virus. And so while that malaise is very real though, what we've seen over time is that more and more people are beginning to question the, the medical advice that they get from medical experts. And um, you know, if you even look at Dr. Fauci, for instance, uh, he has been so deified and also so demonized by both sides that you have Republicans and Democrats both literally running fundraising ads right now to try and, and you know, uh, cash in on some of his appeal. So he's certainly fraught. Right. And Ryan Grimm, I guess the problem would be that if Biden were to decide to get rid of Fauci, there would be enormous pushback from the left. Well, not not from the the left left, uh, but you know, there Fauci does have a you know among resistance Democrats, among kind of resistance liberals, the, the kind of suburban core that that made up the opposition to Trump. He, there is a reverence there for him, but you're seeing that start to slide. You know, he doesn't get down to 31 percent without losing some of them as well. I think the CDC's move from uh, saying that you should quarantine for 10 days down to five days, and then, and then the CDC's admitting that they made that under pressure, 
was a last straw for a lot of people. And it combines with what you're talking about, which is people's fatigue when it comes to the pandemic. And Fauci becomes a proxy for the pandemic. And so I think people are just sick of the pandemic. And by extension, they're therefore then sick of Fauci. So the only way that Biden could ease out of this would be through a retirement. Uh, I, I don't I don't think he can he can fire Fauci because there are so many dedicated partisan Democrats who are so strongly behind him that he can't he can't risk alienating the few people that are still excited about him. But Fauci has had a very long career. At some point, he's going to retire. You could see the White House nudging him and saying, why don't we make that point relatively soon and, and announce a nice, you know, a, a, a nice runway that we're going to land on over the next several months while we find a successor who will immediately become polarized. So, Ryan, just out of curiosity, why did you clarify between the left and the resistance left when it came, comes to Fauci? I mean, do you think that the, the left left doesn't like him and the resistance left does? Yes. I mean, the, the, the kind of like democratic socialist left has been pretty skeptical of Fauci for a lot of this, for a lot of the stretch, you know, when he came out in the very beginning and said that, you know, don't, don't, don't go out and buy masks. Masks don't really work. And, you know, right. be, you might right. end up touching your face. And if you touch your face, you're going to get COVID. So don't bother with it. And then a month or so later, you learn that, oh, I was actually lying about that. Masks actually are helpful, uh, but I didn't want there to be a run on masks. I think, you know, from that point on, the kind of democratic socialist stuff is like, okay, you, you have, you've been, if that was a noble lie, fine. It's fine to tell a noble lie, but the right. cost of telling that noble lie is your credibility. So it's time, time for you to move on and somebody with credibility to come in and replace you. And I think ever since then, uh, there's, there's been uh, suspicious of suspicion of, of Fauci from that corner, which is small though. Yeah. Um, all right, Philip, what do you make of this possibility of a, a quiet retirement where Dr. Fauci announces? Because you know what? If you're Dr. Fauci and you've had the career he's had, and I would think at some point you'd say, you know what? I don't need this crap. I mean, this is unbelievable. Getting yelled at by senators on a regular basis, getting death threats. You would think at some point he might say, you know what? I'm good. I'm done. Uh, well, how many other doctors get to be frequent guests on the Sunday shows, though? So that's the flip side of this. I think that Dr. Fauci, um, you know, he certainly sees this as a responsibility, but I also think that he, he enjoys the, the role. Um, it's one that he certainly feels called to. But a moment ago, Ryan really nailed uh, this on the head, which is that um, whether or not it was a noble lie early on on masks or whether it was the lab leak or whether it's on the question of, of herd immunity, we've seen uh, Anthony Fauci make a number of decisions that in retrospect sort of beg the question of whether or not he was making these um, as prudential considerations or whether or not these were solely based off of science. And, you know, we can look back in, you know, years to come and say, you know, maybe this was the right call, maybe it was the wrong call. But, uh, the problem is that Fauci thus far has, has laid his credibility on this, I am one with the science and the science is one with me routine. And when you have moments like when he admitted to the New York Times that he sort of moved the goalposts on herd immunity, that does make a lot of people um, incredibly skeptical because then they say, well, this wasn't just what the science said. You looked at the data and then you made a consideration and you weren't entirely forthright with us. So yeah. I could certainly but, see, you know, past 2022, if he became a, a liability for, for Democrats. But it's, always, but it's always a balance when you're the chief scientist where you have to say, all right, you know, because in theory, if you're the head scientist, what you really want to say to everyone is stay home, stay home, stay home. Don't do anything because that's the best way to protect everyone. Right. And then you have to kind of balance it and you have to say, all right, well, there are practical considerations here. Look, I feel for Dr. Fauci. I've said this before. You know, I've defended Dr. Fauci, although I agree with both of your points about the criticisms. And I've also criticized him. But I do wonder whether, you know, wh whether people who support him. It doesn't matter if the public loses faith in him as a political matter. I would think at some point the Biden administration might have to, let's just say, encourage him to enjoy some time out of the spotlight. Uh, anyway, Philip and Ryan, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. You got it. Thank you.
For the full poll results, head to newsnationnow.com slash polls. Coming up, the Biden administration's vaccine mandate for large businesses was supposed to be a sure thing. I told you, don't bet on it surviving a legal challenge. I don't always get it right, but on this one, well, Supreme Court came down today. Up next. Today, the Supreme Court, in a major ruling, blocked enforcement of the Biden vaccine mandate for businesses with 100 or more employees. But the court did allow the requirement for certain health care workers to go into effect. Republicans celebrated the decision with statements from leaders on Capitol Hill and even former President Trump saying how unconstitutional the mandate was, while President Biden responded saying he was disappointed in the ruling. But look, regardless of what you think, if you're surprised by this ruling, and it appears many, particularly on the left, are, then you probably don't watch the show. I've said since the mandate was announced that this was a tough case for the Biden administration. Here's what I said back in October. As a legal matter, is that this is far from a slam dunk, where the administration is on safe ground, it seems to me, is with regard to mandating government employees and even hospital workers. Whew. Nailed that one. Look, I'm pro-vaccine. I believe in the vaccine's effectiveness. I believe the country would be better off from a public health standpoint if everyone took it. That's not the legal question. The vote was six to three with the three liberal justices in dissent. The unsigned majority opinion said the administration had gone too far in imposing the sweeping requirement. They said in part, although Congress has indisputably given OSHA the power to regulate occupational dangers, it has not given that agency the power to regulate public health more broadly, requiring the vaccination of 84 million Americans selected simply because they work for employers with more than 100 employees certainly falls in the latter category. It is a technical but important distinction that trying to use OSHA to enforce this sort of mandate is the problem. The liberal justices in their dissent, dissent writing in part, in the face of a still raging pandemic, this court tells the agency charged with protecting worker safety that it may not do so in all the workplaces needed. As disease and death continue to mount, this court tells the agency that it cannot respond in the most effective way possible. Now, the vote on the question of the health care workers was flipped five to four with Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Bre uh, Brett Kavanaugh joining the liberal justices. Joining me now to discuss is Harry Littman, the legal affairs columnist for the LA Times, the host and creator of Talking Feds podcast, former U.S. attorney and deputy assistant attorney general. Harry, good to see you. Appreciate it. Um, Likewise, are you surprised? You nailed it. Are you, you nailed it, Dan. I, right. I mean, I don't want to like have you on to tell you to, for you to tell me how great I am, but I'm just curious. What, are you surprised by the ruling? No, having heard the I think anyone who heard the oral argument was pretty persuaded that there were going to be six votes uh, to strike down or to refuse to put a stay on the big vaccine program. And it was a little bit dicier on the second one, but uh, that that both Kavanaugh and Roberts would go to uphold it. But the, the court seemed relatively sympathetic to it. It's under a different kind of authority, the spending clause. But definitely the big ticket holding today, people who'd heard the uh, argument thought that's exactly what's coming down the pike. Well, and Harry, I think it's important for us to remind people this wasn't a constitutional decision, right? People are talking about, oh, it's constitutional, it's unconstitutional. This wasn't a fundamental constitutional case, was it? No, that's right. Yeah, Trump might have gotten that that wrong. <laughs> what the what the majority was saying is OSHA has this power. They do have this power to uh, issue regulations to protect workers against grave risks in emergency situations. And the court was saying that statutory grant of authority from many years ago in Congress isn't enough to cover what they were doing. Why not? mainly because this isn't a workplace danger, said the court, it's an every place danger. Of course, what the dissent said was, look, it doesn't matter it's an every place danger, it is a workplace danger, it is more accentuated in the workplace, and this is the biggest danger we've had in 100 years. It's perverse to not let the, uh, the agency that's charged and has the expertise to make a uniform national rule go forward. Here's the only reason that I got this right, all right? The only reason I got this right is because as soon as Biden passed the mandate, I had on my radio show an expert in OSHA law. And he said to me, you know, just about every time 
OSHA gets challenged on its emergency use authorization, it loses just about every single time. He said, and no one talks about this. And I said, oh, that's super interesting. I had no idea that OSHA lost all the time in these challenges. And so for those people who are saying, oh my goodness, how could this have happened? It's just not that surprising that it happened in this way. Very quickly, Harry, with regard to the health care workers, does this now mean it goes into effect because of the five to four it, ruling? It goes into effect. Both these rulings are still going to be played out on the merits. So the court was issuing temporary holdings. But on health care, yes, as of today, uh, health care workers who get Medicaid bills, who get federal money, have to get a vaccine. Harry Littman. I can't list everything that Harry does again, because including his former stuff and current stuff, he's like me, does a thousand things. Harry Littman, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Happy New Year. Same to you. A new day dawning in the world of Vice President Kamala Harris. It's a new year. She's got a new communications team. Now she's ready to meet the press again. Let's just say it's not going so well. Time now for our Media Act Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. After a rough first year, Vice President Kamala Harris recently brought in a new communications team and has been on an interview tour to try to enhance her political standing. But judging by the interview she did this morning with NBC's Craig Melvin, it doesn't seem to be going as planned. Melvin asked tough but fair questions on a variety of topics, like the 500 million at-home COVID tests the President Biden recently pledged to the nation. The 500 million tests that have been ordered that are going to be sent to every, every American, do we know when those are going out? Shortly. They're going to go out next shortly. They've been, ordered. They've been ordered. We, I have to look at the current information. I think it's going to be by next week. But soon. Absolutely soon. The White House had to immediately issue a, quote, clarification that read, the President's 500 million at-home tests will be sent out later this month. And we expect all contracts to be awarded over the course of the next two weeks. Like, it's never great when the White House has to walk back your comments literally minutes after the interview. Melvin then challenged the vice president on the Biden administration's strategy on the COVID pandemic. And things went from bad to worse. At what point does the administration say, you know what, this strategy isn't working. We're going to change strategies. Six former administration officials last week wrote that open letter urging the administration to change course, to change strategy. Is it time? It is time for us to do what we have been doing, and that time is every day. Every day it is time for us to agree that there are things and tools that are available to us to slow this thing down. What? It's time for us to do what we've been doing. Word salad. You would have thought the new crack media team would have prepared her for that question. Well, then things got really awkward when he asked about her political future as Biden's running mate. Are we going to, uh, to see the same Democratic ticket in 2024? I'm sorry, we are thinking about today. I mean, honestly, the, I, I, I know why you're asking the question, because this is the part of the punditry and the, right. the gossip around places like Washington, D.C. Let me just tell you something. We're focused on the things in front of us. We're focused on what we need to do to, to address issues like affordable child care, what we need to do to ensure So there, there have been that, no conversations that, about 2024? Uh, the, the American people sent us here to do a job. And right now, there's a lot of work to be done, and that's my focus. It sounds Sincerely. like you're at least familiar with some of the punditry. I don't know if you've heard that there've been some. There's been some talk about a a, a Biden Cheney ticket, perhaps in 2024. Did you read that article? I did not. I'm. I no, I did not. And I really could care less about the high class gossip on these issues. You got to give Melvin credit, asking this to her in this way. Not sure if it's high class or if it's even gossip, but. It might not be that surprising if they're soon looking for a new, new communications team. That is our wrap-up of the day's media bias, buzz, and bull. Coming up, explosive new questions tonight about the New York Attorney General's investigation into Andrew Cuomo. Did a critical Cuomo accuser threaten a witness to corroborate her account? Did the Attorney General know that there were credibility issues? 
Rita Glavin, attorney for former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, will join us exclusively up next. This week, we talked about the media not doing its due diligence by ignoring key information about one of former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's key accusers. Now, as I've said before, the right-leaning media never liked Cuomo. The left-leaning media turned on him. So now it seems no one wants to actually do any reporting that doesn't further bolster the current narrative about him, which is, let's forget about him. He's a sexual harasser, and the New York Attorney General report concluded that. We now know that one of the critical accusers, Charlotte Bennett, had been accused of making up a prior sexual misconduct claim and that there may have been a recording to prove it. But now we learn there's a potential issue with another one of the critical accusers and that it may not have just been media negligence. The New York State Attorney General may have turned a blind eye to crucial details about the first woman to come forward against him. At a press conference today in New York, Rita Glavin, attorney for the former governor, revealed a series of text messages which appear to show that, according to Glavin, Lindsey Boylan, another one of the accusers, threatened a witness in the investigation. Now, remember, Boylan claimed, among other things, that Cuomo had asked her to play strip poker. This is one of the most damning accounts against him. Now, there's this guy, Howard Zimsky, He's the head of the New York State Urban Development Agency. He had corroborated that critical claim of Boylan's. But we now learn, according to Glavin, that Zimsky only said that after receiving a threatening note from Boylan. Turns out that Zimsky had originally said that he, quote, didn't have the slightest inkling about such a comment from Cuomo. Rita Glavin revealed today that Boylan used a self-destructing messaging app to send a threatening note to Zimsky saying, quote, I can't wait to destroy your life, you S follower. After that message, Zimsky, with whom Boylan had a relationship that was once more than professional, according to Glavin, backed up Boylan's claim about the strip poker comment. Now, Glavin says that the investigators charged with putting together the attorney general's report never asked Boylan about this text. They were aware of it, decided not to pursue it. And according to Glavin, Zimsky wasn't the only witness that Boylan tampered with. Glavin showed texts that Boylan sent to other unnamed witnesses in the investigation. Messages to one of the witnesses, Boylan allegedly wrote, life is long and so is my memory and so are my resources. Another message, she wrote, the future is coming after a-holes. Further, Glavin says a witness provided information to the AG investigators, which showed that Boylan's media consultant resigned because she thought Boylan was making up her claims about Andrew Cuomo. According to Glavin, the investigators did not follow up on that information either, nor did they heed the claims of numerous witnesses who said they did not find Boylan to be credible. All of which, Rita Glavin says, adds up to a deeply flawed, politically motivated probe. The attorney general's investigation was shoddy. It was one-sided, and there was a predetermined outcome. And number two, that the resulting report was flawed and misleading and disregarded evidence that undermined the conclusions and the allegations that were made. Joining us now is Rita Glavin, attorney for Andrew Cuomo. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dan. All right, so first let me ask you about all of these messages. You heard in my introduction, I have to keep saying according to Glavin, according to Glavin, because th this hasn't been officially released, right, by the attorney general. Um, so how did you get these messages and this information? Okay, with respect to the new information that pertains to the threatening uh, message that Lindsey Boylan sent to Howard Zemsky, once Sheriff Apple filed the misdemeanor criminal complaint against the governor, the um, Albany County had an obligation to start providing me with discovery. So for the first time, I received Howard Zemsky's informal interview memo that was uh, written by the investigators. I also got a copy of Howard Zemsky's testimony. Uh, I also got an unredacted uh, transcript of Lindsey Boylan. And so I know what they did and did not ask her. When the attorney general talks about, oh, I released thousands of pages of you know, exhibits and transcripts, no. 
she's only released um, about 30 of the transcripts of the 179 people who were interviewed. I now have informal interview memos from a bunch of other people that the attorney general does not reference in her report. And what I learned is that Howard Zemsky told uh, AG investigators in early July of 2021, and this is after that they had interviewed Lindsey Boylan, and he told them that he received this message from her and it, that she sent it to him on what's called the Confide app, which automatically self-deletes uh, the text. You can't screenshot it. You can't screen shoot it. You can't take a photo of it. And what she said is, and what he testified to this, he told them this and then he testified to it again. She said, I can't wait to destroy your life, your SHIT follower. How does the AG not include that in the report, particularly because what's the motive behind her? What did she have on Howard Zemsky to say that? And Howard Zemsky did tell the investigators in early July of 2021, and I have the memo, and um, we will release the memo. Uh, the AG has it, but we will release it. And uh, he admitted that in late 2017, there was an evening and they had a relationship that was more than professional. And uh, this was something that had gotten around the Empire State Development Corporation. There had been rumors about it. It had even gone up to the general counsel, to the ESD, who's now Kathy Hochul's counsel. Um, and she knew about this. And they were both brought in, Zemsky and David, they were in, uh, Zemsky and uh, Lindsey Boylan, and they were interviewed by the counsel of the governor, Alfonso David, who also testified right. in this case. But they redacted the portions of Alfonso David's testimony, and they both denied this having happened. But uh, right. Mr. Zemsky let me, let me ask you, did testify let, about let me, it. Sure. Let me ask you just a big picture question, because I think there are going to be a lot of people who are going to lose sight of the some of the details here, right, with Zemsky and this and these names, yes. et cetera. I, I tried to lay it out at the outset to explain to people what the heart of your argument was. But you know that there are going to be people who are going to say, oh, she's nitpicking about this and that. And, and Letitia James has actually responded to your press conference in a statement through a spokesperson. And she said, quote, another day, another attempt by the former governor to attack the brave women who called out his abuse. Thousands of pages of transcripts, exhibits, videos, and other evidence have already been publicly released. But these lies continue in an effort to mask the truth. Andrew Cuomo sexually harassed multiple women. Your response. Yes, uh, Governor Cuomo didn't sexually harass a single woman. And the attorney general, through, through her August 3rd press conference, has been uh, perpetuating a charade. She, her report doesn't go through each of these women and apply the sexual harassment laws. It's my job as the governor's lawyer, you know, people say I'm nitpicking. No, these are serious credibility issues that the attorney general knew about, ignored, and didn't ask any of the complainants about. And in fact, when they interviewed the governor, they didn't show him pictures that contradicted what some of these women had said. I welcome, okay, every time the attorney general has been asked about this, she won't answer a specific question. In her five-week campaign for governor, all she goes back to is, we've released thousands of pages. Yeah, you have, but you have 74,000 pages and you've released maybe 100 exhibits. You had 179 people interviewed most of whom were done by informal interviews, and you've never shared them with me. Why not? I've been asking since day one. And it's because the narrative so, was that the attorney general was going to have a report done with biased investigators that would run the governor out of office and so that she could run her, for governor herself. Let me ask you the big picture, though. There are Again, material in terms issues. Of, yeah. In terms of the number of women, right, there are going to be people who are going to say, OK, let's even assume you're right about one or two. It's just that there's so many women making similar-ish, and it's, they're not all similar, but similar-ish allegations here. And as a result, isn't it time, I think some people will say, to sort of move on? Your response. You can't move on. You can't move on when there has been an injustice. And the attorney general has said that repeatedly. The governor needs to move on with his life. When someone has been unjustly uh, found to have done something that they didn't do, you will never move on. I see it every day. Uh, I see it every day with defendants in criminal cases. I see it every day with defendants in civil cases. With respect to this whole mantra, oh, there's 11 women, there's 11 women, there's not. 
The case really comes down to two or three of the women, particularly Brittany uh, Camiso, uh, Charlotte Bennett, and Lindsey Boylan. With respect to the remaining allegations, the gov they are qualitatively different, and the governor doesn't dispute a number of them. You know, one of the 11 is a woman that the governor kissed on the cheek at a wedding who didn't even work for him. Another of the 11 is a doctor who gave the governor a COVID test, and the governor said, you make that mask or you make that gown look good or the mask look good. None of this rises to the level of sexual harassment, but it has been overplayed, and no one in the media has gone through each of the 11 to say, this is not sexual harassment. It's not sexual Dude. harassment um, you know, to have pe petty slights and trivial inconveniences. But uh, why I'm focusing I, on the two or three most serious allegations is that there are clear problems with their credibility. The media did not understood. want to explore it, and they ignored it. Understood. Final question. I've only got a second for it. Do you expect that the governor is yeah. going to run for re-election? The former governor is going to run for re-election? Oh, I, I, I can't comment on it because I'm not... Um, I'm not a political advisor to the gov governor. There's one thing, though, Dan, that you mentioned that I do want to correct. Um, you referred to earlier on about one of the media consultants who worked for Lindsey Boylan. Her name is Lupe Todd Medina. I have now been informed, I did not know this, that the attorney general's office did interview her. The reason I have not seen evidence that she had been interviewed is because the attorney general won't give me the evidence. Um, what I can tell you is right. that uh, pe people close to the governor in December of 2020 had been told, as I understood it, uh, that she left Boylan's campaign within a day or two after the allegations because right. she took issue with the allegations. But I've learned she was interviewed. Well, Dan, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. This has been an important uh, issue. Uh, I hope the media digs further on this because what happened when this was released on August 3rd is everybody jumped on the bandwagon because I think they were afraid to challenge and look with a discerning eye about what these allegations were and they were not. Rita Glavin, thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Coming up, someone better option the rights this next story. Guy fakes his own death after giving a sob story that he was dying of cancer. It gets tons of media coverage about his death but a reporter's skeptical turns out the guy's alive the reporter who didn't fall for the ruse will join us live a rhode island man is back from the dead yep he apparently faked his own death to evade sex assault charges and has been a found alive and well many in rhode island including the media local politicians and even his own family believed that Nicholas Alaverdian had died in February 2020 from non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Turns out they were duped. In early 2020, Alaverdian reached out to multiple media outlets in Rhode Island, telling them about his impending death. He was already actually known in the media as an outspoken child welfare reform advocate. Then a woman claiming to be his wife confirmed he had died, and an obit was published in late February 2020. Local news outlets reported that he died. His life was even eulogized at the Rhode Island State House, where he was praised for his work fighting for children. I'm to join in the memory of my friend, and I guess some of the people may know him also, Nicholas Alaverdian, who had a battle with cancer. Uh, a very, very smart individual when I started here some eight years ago. And I say this on purpose. And I say this to you young people that are standing there, have passion in what you do and never give up on it. He had that. And it touched me to be honored to get up to say something on his behalf. I, you know, I feel bad for that guy. <laughs> he was not dead. He was alive. He was fleeing law enforcement. Authorities, including Interpol, were finally able to track him down in Glasgow, Scotland, at a hospital suffering from COVID. DNA connected him to a 2008 sex assault in Utah, as well as a sex assault in Ohio. The Utah County Attorney's Office says he was able to avoid law enforcement using multiple aliases, including his birth name, Nicholas Rossi. Rossi. They released a statement saying in part he's been taken into custody, and the Utah County Attorney's Office is working with federal and international agencies to extradite Mr. Rossi back to Utah. Some of the guy's families saying they were fooled including his uncle who planned a funeral after he received a request from a woman he thought was Aliverdian's wife. 
I'm shocked. I, in all honesty, I feel like I was used a little bit. I went along with it, you know, meaning I was unaware that this was a setup. Meanwhile, Utah officials believe there could be actually more victims. We believe that there are other victims out there, whether those victims are in Rhode Island or in Ohio or in Utah or in Scotland or anywhere else this individual has been. Joining us now has been following Nicholas Alaverdian for years and doubted the death reports all along. Investigative reporter Walt Buto, now working for Next Star Station WFLA in Tampa, Florida. Walt, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. What made you suspicious about this? I think I think just years of covering Nicholas. Um, he called me when he he to tell me about his uh, his disease that he was dying from, and the voice seemed a little uh, I don't know. It was it seemed a little phony at the time, and there were doubts. And he was pushing a story. He wanted a story told about him about his crusading efforts to reform child care uh, with uh, DCYF, DC, the DCF version in Rhode Island. And and plus the, the the woman you talked about, Louise, his uh, his wife was a um, the voice seemed to be uh, I don't know there was just something wrong with the voice um, and we do believe at this point that that was not a woman Louise that was actually Nicholas using some sort of device to disguise the voice. Wow! So he couldn't just die quietly, right? He couldn't just sort of go away. He needed to sort of be eulogized and celebrated for his life before disappearing. He, he wanted to be uh, eulogized in, in the media. And I told him, I said, Nicholas, I understand you've done some work at the State House to uh, fight for children. Nicholas had claimed mm -hmm. and had actually been awarded in a federal courtroom uh, a, um, a settlement for, for uh, being um, sexually abused in group homes outside of Rhode Island. He had been placed in group homes in Florida and in Nebraska. And he had won a case. He represented himself, by the way, a smart guy, wrote, the, wrote all the documents. He represented himself in federal court. A federal judge believed it and, and did. There was a settlement undisclosed. Um, so, so, you know, all that sort of played into the fact that, that now he was able to fight for these children who needed people to fight for them. And he wanted that story told. But I told him I can't tell that story without telling the part about him being a, uh, a, a registered sex offender and about the case in Ohio, which was the first one to surface, which was a uh, sexual, a misdemeanor sexual assault in Ohio. And that's the first one to surface. But as we looked into this after his death, I had many sources telling me about the case in Utah, which we could not confirm. And we had, uh, we had other sources telling us about cases in other states as the individual in Utah referenced wow. in that soundbite. All right, Walt, I'm sorry we didn't have more time for this. I love this story, and I appreciate yeah. the hard work that you did on this. Um, we got, you know, we went over with Andrew Cuomo's lawyer, but uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Maybe we'll do a follow-up with you on it. No problem. Thanks, Dan. Coming up, officers surround a house inside a barricade situation with a woman who says the suspect had her guns. The insane body cam video shows the officers racing to de-escalate. That's next. We're on scene tonight with body cam and surveillance video from the New York City Police Department showing the dangers officers face every day, even when they're off duty. Police in Queens responded when one of their own called 911. The off duty officer said she had an argument with her husband, Marco Mascara, who broke picture frames and other items in the home, then grabbed her service weapons and pointed the guns at her. Police arrived with the emergency services unit and hostage negotiation team. They tried to get into the home, then found the door was barricaded. Cameras on? Ram. More shots. The suspect fired an officer, shooting from the top of the stairs, shattering the glass in a front door. Negotiators tried to get him to surrender before he fired more shots. Marco, nobody's hurt yet. Come down here. Drop the gun and come out. All you got to do is throw that gun down the stairs and it's over. I promise nobody's going to hurt you. As negotiations continued, police pried open the 
other front door. Officers made their way inside the home to the backyard to try and help the off-duty officer get to safety. Police told the woman to jump. She came down. One officer covered her with a ballistic blanket to shield her from gunfire. The suspect then shot at the officers who returned fire. Hitting the suspect in his right forearm, he was treated at a hospital and then charged with multiple crimes, including four counts of first-degree murder, attempted murder, and four counts of attempted aggravated assault on an officer. Police found the guns the suspect used at the scene. The off-duty officer suffered a broken leg when she jumped from the window. Was expected to return to duty. None of the officers who responded were injured. Joining me now, Sean Six Larkin, retired Tulsa police lieutenant. Sticks, I would think when a fellow officer makes this kind of call, arriving officers are going to be very careful. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, we respond to every one of these type of calls that come in through 911. But when we know it's a fellow officer, it kind of, you know, heightens it up a little bit more for us. Uh, I, I guess I'd say it's almost a little bit personal. Um, so we want to get in there, make sure we do the, you know, do things, try to get uh, get that officer out safely. And in particular, when there was the report that that this guy had taken her service revolvers, right? Yeah, listen, a police officer never wants their gun in the hands of somebody else pointing it against them, whether we're in uniform or at home like this. So uh, I can only imagine what she was feeling going through that scenario at, you know, seven o'clock in the morning or whatever this was. Uh, absolutely horrifying deal for her to go through. And the officers, again, had to be very careful at that front door. Yeah, exactly. You know, what they actually end up doing was they, uh, they, they end up making entry into a side door. It looks like it's a duplex, which allowed them to get out into the back courtyard area. And there were people inside of there that they actually had to get out and get to safety as well. So I know we're not able to cover it here in this piece tonight, but they actually escorted, you know, other people out to safety while they were dealing with this. Sean Larkin, thank you. Appreciate it. Always, Dan. That does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime with Marnie Hughes starts right now. Boy, when we have 10 seconds left. We had to make everything so, so tight to get to the end of this show because we went long. Now we got 10 seconds. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.